You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 26, 2024. We are doing How the Immune System Works by Dr. Lauren Sumperiak. We are doing Chapter 1, which is an overview. This is presented by Dr. Nikita Rajay. She is an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine, Pediatrics, and is the Chief in the Section of Allergy Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital. Our next topic would be Dr. Rajay. She's our, our, our immunologist at Children's Mercy here. She conducts an immunology course every year and uh, has a couple of books, resources that she goes through chapter by chapter. And she's going to be talking on what chapter one and two of um, some Payrack today. Um, and then I, what I'm hoping is if I can share my updated schedules with the rest of you, you'll know in advance what chapters we may be reviewing. Okay. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Raji. Thanks. And I apologize. I'm going to have to jump off in a few minutes here. Thanks, Chris. Thank uh, ho hopefully you guys can see my screen and uh, hear me well. Uh, let me know if otherwise. But um uh, let's get started. So first day, I'm definitely uh, starting this course earlier than every year. Uh, and hopefully we have enough time in the year to have some clinical talks as well. But the purpose of this series is uh, to go over basic immunology and we'll use the two textbooks as mentioned here. Um, so the first one is How the Immune System Works by Lauren Somparak. We'll be using the seventh edition um, and then we'll go on to talk about each chapter in Abbas. Um, I use the first textbook with its funny analogies to explain how simple and easy it is to understand the immune system. But once I'm done with that, I'm going to use the other textbook to show how complex and complicated the immune system is. Uh, but regardless, I'm hoping that I can um, pique some interest in for immunology for you all, all of you, and uh, hopefully you guys can appreciate how elegantly the immune system is designed. Uh, so uh, we will start with uh, chapter one uh, for uh, Lauren Somparak. But uh, overall for the coursework, uh, the purpose of the coursework is to prepare you guys for the boards, but also understand uh, what the foundation is for, for immunology when you see these uh, some of the complex immunology patients in clinics or in uh, inpatient. And then you guys are going to be the experts when the next generation uh, comes in and um, asks you questions about why we do uh, some of the things that we do from immunological point of view. Uh, how to prepare for these uh, these talks? Uh, I suggest that you pre-read because it's a complex subject and make sure that you have had a uh, good reading of the chapter before you come in, um, read again, and then second years, I suggest that you start memorizing some of the uh, information that's included here. So let's get started for today's talk. Um, We'll be talking about chapter one. It's an overview of the immune system. Uh, my email is included here in case you guys have questions or comments afterwards. All right, so these are uh, Lawrence Ompirak's words. Basically, she says we are going to be talking about just the big picture here in this textbook. We are just going to go through the rules of the immune system. Of course, there are lots of exceptions to all the rules that we talk about, but we'll hopefully dissect all of those when we talk about uh, talk more in detail about these topics. Um, the information included in this textbook is really current knowledge and it's a moving target and every edition that comes through there are lots of changes because the immunology knowledge is evolving. We'll talk about lots of analogies, talking about team effort, how there are lots of players in the immune system and we need, it's important to know all the players. We'll use a lot of analogies about football and we'll be talking about um, war and you know just kind of analogies that we, we are going to use to understand immunology uh, here so what does she mean by uh, players uh, like a football game basically it's a team effort where there are lots of players uh, of the immune system that take part in providing the immune response and you have to know uh, the 
offense team and the defense team and uh, if you are really zoomed in on and watching it a football game on a uh, on a smaller screen uh, you may not catch every bit of information of what's going on on the ground um, and so you may not realize what the other players are doing and they may have an important role to play in the overall uh, game um, outcome that's uh, that might not be as evident um, there are lots of layers of defense in the football game and similarly there are layers of defense in uh, the immune system the first line of defense is the physical barriers uh, and i might go through s some of the initial slides that's all knowledge from medical school uh, a real uh, really a little faster and then we'll we'll go more into depth of some of these concepts so the first line of defense is the physical barriers uh, that's provided by the skin skin and mucous membranes and the skin is about two square meters uh, of area that uh, that's covered and that's the uh, physical barrier that's provided whereas the mucous membranes are really a huge uh, surface area that needs to be covered it's almost similar to two tennis courts and the physical barrier is important to provide that uh, first line the second line of defense is provided by the innate immune system and then the third line of defense is the adaptive immune system so we'll be talking this is an overview so we'll go through some of these concepts of innate immune system and the uh, adaptive immune system uh, so what's the innate immune system what does innate mean innate means it's there it's naturally present it's been present for millions of years and it's hardwired doesn't change uh, to give you an idea let's think about someone who's walking barefoot on the ground uh, and gets a splinter in the toe and uh, likely what you're gonna end up noticing is a redness and swelling and pain at that site and one cell that might be responsible for that is the part of the innate immune system which is a macrophage um, and where do these macrophages come from they come from the bone marrow uh, that are the factories of the stem cells these stem cells are self-renewing which means they give rise to one a similar cell and then they also have a cell that gives rise to various types of um, uh, cells such as uh, red cells uh, megakaryocytes or platelets and then different types of white cells whether lymphocytic or um, uh, myeloid cells how does the macrophage know uh, how when to when it needs to act really it doesn't it hangs out in the uh, tissue all the time and it's uh, almost like a garbage collector it collects that garbage all the time and uh, almost like waiting for you to get a splinter in the foot so that it can do some real work uh, but they hang out and collect garbage whatever is in their environment they are uh, trying to get get sense of what in the, around them um, and then if they come across uh, some kind of um, signal uh, that it, that tells them that it's a danger molecule uh, such as maybe a bacterial wall lipid or a carbohydrate then it's going to be uh, activated it's going to uh, uh, get the attention of macrophage and these molecules are called you know the find me and eat me molecules which tell the macrophages that uh, they are going to take big sips and collect that uh, uh, actively so when the um, that when they are taking these sips that process is called phagocytosis uh, here is a bacteria outside of macrophage it's basically usually takes small sips but when it comes across that find me and eat me molecule it might actually take a big sip to take make a pouch called phagosome and that phagosome may be it may be able to collect that uh, microbe such as bacteria inside it once that it forms that pouch of phagosome it can bind to another uh, pouch called lysosome and once they fuse lysosome has the chemicals that will help to kill that bacteria so that's how the macrophages undergo uh, undergo the process of phagocytosis uh, phagos means eating and cyte means a cell so cell that eats is called a phagocyte um, so uh, what else can these macrophages do uh, these macrophages uh, during the battle with that those microbes can release some protein messengers these messengers are called cytokines so they can take the cytokines can take that message from the 
macrophages to the blood circulation to give the message that they need help. So they can these cytokines can help recruit other cells to the site of infection. These could be neutrophils or eosinophils based on the type of infection. It could be more mon monocytes that will be attracted, go into the tissue and become macrophages. And so till the, all these cells come to the site of infection, the macrophages are the ones that are going to uh, continue to fight that bacteria by themselves. So that response of all these cells coming together and fighting that invader uh, is what gives rise to what we know as inflammation. So overall, what do we see at the site of the uh, infection? We see that the, uh, there are chemicals that are given off that increase the blood flow to that area uh, and that gives the redness or the sign of inflammation. There are chemicals that cause the cells of the endothelium to contract. So there is space between them and then there is fluid leakage between them that gives the swelling. And then the chemicals stimulate the nerves that causes the pain at the site of the infection. And that's uh, th that those are the signs of inflammation that we really see. All right. Uh, so other players of the innate immune system, there are some cells called natural killer cells, a type of lymphocyte. These cells, even though they are lymphocytes, they are part of the innate immune system. They kill the virus infected cells, cells that are damaged. They could be damaged by viruses or bacteria or parasites or cancer cells. Cells that are damaged are the ones that are uh, targets for these natural killer cells. And then there are proteins such as complements that are also part of the uh, innate immune system. All right, and then so what do the complements do? They punch holes in the bacteria and kill. And we'll be talking about that in a minute here. Uh, moving on to the adaptive immune system, we talked about the different cells of the um, innate immune system. The adaptive immune system made, is made up of uh, uh, B and T cells. Um, and as the name suggests, it adapts to the invaders and provides more sophisticated uh, response when needed. Um, but overall, the introduction to the adaptive immune system to humans came from the observation by Edward Jenner. He was a scientist in 1700s who observed that milkmaids uh, would get these uh, this disease called cowpox um, and they had these le lesions around their hands. Uh, but uh, the milkmaids who got the cowpox uh, were the ones that mostly wouldn't get smallpox. So he, he observed that and he did an experiment. He took the pus from those cowpox lesions from someone and uh, inoculated a boy named James Phipps uh, with that. And um, if that, that was not enough, he then went on to inoculate him again uh, with the pus from smallpox uh, from another patient. And uh, thankfully, James Phipps did not get smallpox after that, uh, which tool, which kind of was his experiment was successful in showing that it, the um, the cowpox lesion pus was helpful in protecting him against the smallpox. Because this came from a cow uh, who, that's known as waka, the, this substance was called vaccine and that's what that was our introduction to vaccines. So a little bit of history there. Uh, talking about the adaptive immune system, we know there are B cells and T cells. The name B cells comes from Bursa fibricius. Uh, in humans, it comes. these cells come from the bone marrow and these B cells then transform into plasma cells that are factories of antibodies. Antibodies are what I uh, think of as weapons that are uh, cells used to fight some of these infections. They can, they can be active against any kind of organic molecule. So what do these antibodies look like? Here is a picture uh, showing the two light chains and two heavy chains. Together, these chains form these two regions called antigen binding site uh, or region called FAB, so fragment that is antigen uh, binding versus the FC region, which is the constant region uh, that is mostly formed by the heavy chains. Uh, so two light chains, two heavy chains give rise to two FAB regions where the antigen binds and 
the FC region that can bind to the receptors on the other cells such as macrophages. And so the heavy chain or the constant region is the one that actually is uh, determines the function, how these, uh, these antibodies can function once they attach to the antigen. So um, they also determine the class of the antibody. Uh, and the classes of antibodies, as we know, antibodies are called immunoglobulins, and these are the different classes, G, A, M, E, D, uh, different kinds of antibodies that we know of. Um, so the, uh, talking about more about the structure of the antibodies, let's talk about FAB, so the antigen binding region. Um, and um, these antibodies have varied specificities that helps us have the antibodies that can bind to various antigens. Uh, there are about 100 million specificities of these antibodies, which are important to bind to different kinds of antigens. However, to make such different antibodies, 100 million different types of uh, FAB regions, you would need about 10,000 heavy chains and 10,000 light chains to come up with different combinations of those FAB regions. But that would also mean that about 20, 25,000 genes uh, would be used up, most of them would be used up in just making antibodies, uh, but we know that B cells would need genes for other reasons as well. So this is probably not the most uh, plausible uh, um, mechanism by which these different FAB regions are formed. And so there, is, uh, it was found that these antibodies are formed by um, a recombination of the gene segments. And so the antibody diversity that we see is thanks to the recombination of gene segments that's found in the B cell DNA. So if there is this uh, immature B cell DNA that's present, it has various re uh, regions or segments called uh, variable segments, V segments, D segments, J segments and all of these and there are C which is the constant region for each of the class of antibody uh, which helps with the classes but the V, D and J segments have to recombine or it's a mix and match kind of a uh, situation where one of the V region binds to one of the D and J regions to come up with a um, combination that would give rise to one type of um, antibody specificity. So all these combinations can end up in various specificities or hundred millions of them that can that our body can have. So there are about three billion B cells, but only few have antibodies or produce antibodies with one type of specificity. So even though there are 300, 3 billion of B cells, the ones that are specific to say one type of protein on, uh, on the or antigen on the flu virus might be only a few of them. So they have to be recruited when it come, that B cell comes across that particular antigen in the flu season. Uh, so these antibodies, of course, would not be enough. Few antibodies would not be enough to take care of that infection, um, but the antibodies are produced on demand. So what it does is uh, that it selects um, uh, the uh, what type of antibody needs to be produced and that's produced in uh, a higher amount uh, when that particular antigen is present. So how does it do that? B cells on their surface have a, mol uh, have a structure called B cell receptor and B cell receptor is pretty much is like a bait uh, uh, for fishing. So basically it has that structure that's specific for that antigen and it continues to look for the antigen. And when it comes across it, it will get activated and form a group of B cells of that type. But you have to realize that uh, most of the B cells are not going to be activated. So, you know, a lot of uh, these B cells might be specific for things that we may never come across. Um, for example, there might be something for uh, HIV virus or there might be something for rabies virus and lots of other things, other antigens in the nature uh, that we may never come across. And so those uh, B cells will never get activated. And so the author says that most B cells, uh, the BCRs are uh, bait for fishing, but most fish in vain and don't come across that antigen. Uh, 
but say it's a B cell that's specific for um, uh, for flu virus, and uh, once it comes across that antigen, it gets selected. So those B cells will divide and proliferate to make a bigger group of B cells that are specific for that particular antigen, and that group of B cells is called a clone of B cells. Once that clone is sufficiently large, it can differentiate into plasma cells and uh, plasma cells will give rise to the antibodies specific to that antigen. Once those invaders are conquered, B cells will die. Those B cells will die. Um, so what's the uh, function uh, of these B cells, uh, oh, sorry, these antibodies. So the antibodies are produced and now they are ready to fight. But what do they do? So what these antibodies identify the invaders uh, and tag them for destruction. So once they are bound by their FAB region to the antigen, they pretty much tag them to say, okay, this is this is a problem this antigen needs to be taken care of and that process is called opsonization so they prepare them for eating opsonization means to prepare for eating and um, these antibodies use this function of opsonization which means they tag them so that other cells that bind that antigen can eat them so the FC regions that are free after the FAB region binds to the antigen can bind to a phagocyte that will eat that um, um, eat that antigen or micro. The other uh, function of the um, of these antibodies is uh, they help in preventing. Uh, the replication of the virus or the bug. Um, so, for example, viruses use cell machinery for their survival uh, and uh, kill the cell and then infect the neighboring cells. The function of the antibodies is neutralization, which means these bind to the virus that is outside the cell and prevent them from entering another cell. And so they prevent them from replicating uh, so that they can um, curb the infection. Um, so kind of giving you an example for this uh, or analogy is that there is a receiving line at a wedding uh, and the job of the line is to make sure that there is no outsider coming in. Uh, but if there is an outsider, the receivers will bring in the bouncer to take, care, take the person out. Same way the antibodies will identify the invader, but they will really not take care of it. They'll call the bouncer, which is the phagocyte and the phagocytes will actually come and take care of that invader. All right, We're talking about the T cells, we talked about the B cells. So comparison to B cells, uh, here are the T cells. So T cells are 300 billion. We talked about B cells that are 3 billion. T cells are way more abundant, 300 billion T cells. These come from the bone marrow as well, and then they get uh, trained to fight infections in thymus. So they mature in the thymus, and they also have the T cell receptor on their surface, similar to B cell receptors. These T cell receptors are also formed by the modular design that we saw in B cells where they are formed by the B cell, uh, sorry, the VDJ recombination. Once they are formed, they are ready to look for their, uh, uh, they are like a bait for fishing and they are looking for a, a, an antigen that is specific for that TCR. Uh, if they come across that bait, then they are going to, sorry, they, at that antigen, um, that bait would work and they would activate the T cell and that those T cells proliferate to form a clone. So the clone gets selected and then they proliferate to form a bigger clone of that particular T cell receptor uh, bearing T cells. There are three types of T cells, uh, helper T cells, killer T cells and regulatory T cells. Helper T cells are the quarterbacks of the team, which means they kind of help in play a big role in um, in that play. Uh, they are the cytokine factories that determine what cell, uh, what cytokines will help and recruit what cells. Uh, killer T cells help with the assisted uh, killing of the infected cells and then regulatory T cells prevent overreaction of the immune system. So again, there's a few differences from of T cell from B cell. T cells just recognize protein or peptide antigens. B cells can recognize any organic molecule, but T cells only provide an immune response to protein antigen. 
they require, the T cells require the antigen to be presented to them on a silver platter compared to B cells that recognize those antigens directly. So really T cells are just going to sit there, wait for the antigen presentation to happen so that they can react to that particular protein antigen. Um, say if there is a viral infection, once the virus is inside a cell, antibodies that come from B cells cannot tackle that virus and they can continue to survive in the cell, but the T cells can actually act against the intracellular organisms. So that's one more difference. So I talked about how T cells need a silver platter on which they need to be presented with the antigen that they will provide response to. What's this platter? This platter is like a billboard, uh, which means that they will be used by antigen presenting cells. Antigen presenting cells are dendritic cells, macrophages and activated B cells. These cells uh, have class 2 MHC on them. Uh, that acts as a billboard. It will actually bind to an, um, an antigen on its surface and show it to the TCR, T cell receptor, that it can bind to, to say that this can be a problem. Now, those class 2 MHC are only present on the antigen presenting cells. However, most of the cells of the body have class 1 MHC on them, and they can also use that class 1 MHC is almost like a billboard that will show what's going on inside the cell. So if there is a virus inside the cell that's making its own antigens, those antigens can be displayed on the surface to be presented to the T cells. So these billboards can be two different types and T, T cells, when they are looking at the MHC molecule, can be looking at a pouch that has closed corners because of which, like class 1 MHC, that will hold a very specific uh, length of the protein fragment uh, that is 9 amino acids in length. That's something like class 1 MHC on the top here that it only holds a, the grooves ends are closed, so it can only hold a specific number of amino acids. So the peptide fragment is, is smaller versus the class 2 MHC groove is open and so it can hold a longer peptide that can be presented to T cells uh, and can be about 20 amino acids large. So we talked about B cells and T cells. There are a few features of the adaptive immune system that are important to know uh, how these cells get activated, how they use the secondary lymphoid organs in their function, and that they have immunological memory and tolerance to self. So how does the activation of the adaptive immune system work? There are two signals. Uh, first signal is the TCR and the antigen presented by the antigen presenting cell, sorry, here, up here, uh, versus they also need a second signal that is nonspecific, uh, that is uh, nonspecific and basically uh, provides the information that there is a danger. Uh, what does that mean? So say you go to a bank to uh, access your safety deposit box. Uh, when you go there, you have your keys that you can put in the deposit box, but you also need the banker to go and use their key so that they can, that both the keys have to be in there for your safety deposit box to be accessed. And why is that? That's a second signal or second mechanism safety uh, uh, for, for safety concerns so that uh, the banker can confirm that this is a valid um, access, right? So similarly, immune system, it can be very powerful, but it has its dangers. So before it is activated, there is a safety mechanism in place uh, where the macrophages or the antigen presenting cells, when they present an antigen, uh, the T cells make sure that they can bind to it using TCR, so specific to that TCR. And once it can do that, it wants to make sure that before it reacts to it, is it dangerous? If it's not dangerous, it does not need to provide that immune response. So to pro make sure that it's a danger molecule that it's reacting to, it uses signals such as CD28. If it binds to its signal B7 on the antigen presenting cell, it's going to make sure it has that first signal and the second signal, and now it's going to be activated. So that's how the activation of adaptive immune system works. 
What's the role of the secondary lymphoid organs? So there are only about 100 or 1000 T cells that have a TCR that's specific to a given invader. I continue to use the example of flu virus. Say it's flu season and the flu virus has various antigens. And for that one particular antigen, there are 100 T cells with that specific specificity for that antigen. But how would that T cell, T cell needs presentation of that antigen to it. So it needs to come in contact with an antigen presenting cell that bears that particular antigen. So how are these 100 T cells that are just sitting there roaming around know where to find that antigen? So to Im improve the chances of that, the secondary lymphoid organs are in place. Uh, what does that mean? We know that there are two plumbing systems for the body, the high pressure cardiovascular system and then the low pressure uh, lymphatic system. Along the lymphatic system or lymphatics are these groups of uh, lymph nodes and they are like a dating bar and the T cells and B cells circulate from one to another and are looking for their date which is the antigen presenting cell that's specific for that antigen for their antigen. And as they move from one, in, one lymph node to another, if there is an infection, say in the lungs, and the draining lymph nodes up there might have the antigen presenting cell with that particular virus, and the lymph T cells and B cells, when they recirculate to that place, they'll come across that antigen and be activated. So that's how the secondary lymphoid organs act like dating bars for the T cells and their present antigen presenting cells. Uh, these T and B cells have uh, immunological memory. That's what's the uh, whole concept of adaptivity is. So most activated cells of the clones, once they clear that antigen, are going to die. But a few of them are left over, which are the memory cells. These are more experienced and they are easier to activate if that infection recurs. Another concept is tolerance to self. We, these T and B cells are very, very powerful and we want to make sure that they don't start reacting to self antigens. And so they, uh, they have to recognize self antigens and be tolerant to them. If there is failure of this tolerance to develop, then you can have autoimmune disorders. All right, so uh, uh, last slide from chapter one. Uh, we want to make sure uh, that we talk about the differences between innate and adaptive immune system. So why do we need both? Adaptive immune system is great. It's very sophisticated. T and B cells can take care of every antigen. Why do we even need innate immune system? So to explain that, think about you go out of town and you are wearing shoes and you take your shoes off somewhere and uh, you lose them. And you really need shoes to go from one place to another. Uh, so there you have a couple of choices. There is a the shoe shop that has shoes in general that you would find versus there is a sh shop where the, you can get a custom fit sh uh, shoes. Well, it's great to get custom fit shoes. However, at that time you need something that's ready to go uh, and that's uh, uh, that and get your need taken care of. And so similarly, innate immune systems ready to go. It's present. It's uh, it's faster to act and can uh, uh, and can be activated or active in minutes. Uh, it meets most of the day-to-day -day needs and can hold the invaders at bay. However, the adaptive immune system is needed because even though innate immune system is uh, very helpful, sometimes you need more sophisticated uh, response that is provided by adaptive immune system. Also, it's important to know that adaptive immune system, it's diverse, it's sophisticated, but it's clueless of what's a danger and what's not. So if it has, it's a TCR or a BCR that can attach to an antigen, then it can react to it if it knows, but it doesn't know when to react unless it's told it's a danger molecule. So the in, it's the job of the innate immune system to distinguish what's safe and what's not so that it only reacts to uh, the danger molecules. Uh, innate immune system senses the danger, formulates a plan of action and activates the adaptive immune system and really informs the game plan to it. It instructs when to mobilize weapons and where to, go, uh, where to take them. And so really if the T cells or helper T cells are the quarterback, then the antigen presenting cells and the innate immune system are the coach that are needed for the quarterbacks to function. 
All right, so that was the end of chapter one. We move on to chapter two. Any questions at this point? All right, we can go on and talk about chapter two. That's a discussion about innate immune system. This is the outline. We'll talk about complement phagocytes and then the rest of it is a combination of how we go through that. So let's talk about the complement system. It's a system of about 20 uh, proteins that work together to kill the pathogens and signal other immune system players that the attack is on. These are formed in the fetal uh, life um, in the first trimester and uh, they are ready to go when a child is born. Uh, they are formed, uh, they are developed or produced in the liver and they do need activation before they can function, but it doesn't take long for them to be activated. And so there are Path, three pathways of complement activation, classical pathway, alternative pathway, and lectin pathway. The classical depends on antibodies for activation, so we'll talk about that with adaptive immune system. But the alternative is spontaneous, and lectin is the smart complement uh, pathway, and we'll talk about these. So the alternative complement pathway. So really, there are, again, as we mentioned, we talk about different complement proteins that are present in the circulation, one of the important ones is C3. So complement fragment C3 is present in the circulation. It's continuously and spontaneously cleaved to its fragments C3B and C3A. C3B binds to pretty much any surface that has amino or hydroxyl group. But this, these groups are usually present in bacterial cells. So this, think of C3Bs being produced and being dropped as grenades all the time in circulation. If they come across something that can make them explode, they will, like amino or hydroxyl group. If they are not, they will be neutralized to water within 60. They get whole 60 microseconds, so I feel bad for them. But that's for protection of our own surfaces so that if there are human uh, structures or self-antigens that are present, they will not bind to those. So C3B, uh, C3B gets 60 microseconds to react to any amino or hydroxyl group that it can attach to. If it does come across a bacterial surface, it will attach to it right away. If it does attach to it, then it can actually recruit another protein called protein B. And once it uh, uh, binds to protein B, another protein called protein D comes and clips that protein B to a smaller fragment BB. So together, C3B, BB is formed, which is a C3 convertase. What does that mean? C3B, sorry, C3 convertase helps to cleave multiple numbers of uh, C3 molecules very efficiently compared to the initial grenades that were falling and spontaneously being cleaved. So that C3BBB is the C3 convertase of alternative pathway that makes more C3B fragments that come together and bind to that initial convertase to form the C5 convertase. And now it can cleave C5 to C5A and C5B, two fragments of C5. And that uh, is the C5 convertase. So two convertases, C3 and C4 convertase, sorry, C5 convertase of alternative complement pathway. What does that do? C5B, now that it's, uh, it's, uh, formed, it can bind to C6, C7, and C8. All four of them form the stock, and that stock can recruit multiple molecules of C9 to form membrane attack complex, which is the goal of the, the complement pathway activation. But again, like the TNB cells, complement pathway can be very powerful and there needs to be a safety net or uh, some safety mechanisms in place so that it's not activated where it's not needed or it's deactivated when its function is done. So there are some complexes or proteins that are in place such as membrane cofactor protein MCP CD46. Uh, C3B is cl clipped to an inactive form by CD46. DK accelerating factor or DAF CD55 accelerates the destruction of the C3 convert and then protectin or CD59 prevents the incorporation of C9 into the membrane attack complex. So all three are in place so that 
complement pathway has regulation. If CD55 or CD59 are defective, you can have paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. All right, moving on to lectin pathway. So if alternative pathway um, molecules or C3B are grenades, lectin is a smart bomb. What does that mean? Uh, so lectin is a protein that can bind to a carbohydrate. And mannose is a carbohydrate in various um, microbes such as candida, salmonella, strep, leishmania, all of these. So MBL, mannose binding lectin, is a complement uh, protein called, that is produced in liver and it can bind to uh, something called mannose binding lectin associated serine protease or MASP. There is MSP1 and 2. MBL binds to an MASP and the MBL is like C3B. It grabs the pathogen and MASP cleaves the C3 to C3B. It's a protease, so it, it helps in cleaving that C3 molecule to C3B. Once that C3B is formed, the further... Uh, uh, progression of the MBL pathway is pretty similar. It forms the C3 convertase and then C5 convertase and then uh, gives rise to the membrane attack complex. For There are few other functions of the complement system apart from uh, the membrane attack complex. It can help with opsonization. There is a fragment called IC3B that helps in opsonization and there are chemoattractants like C5A, C C3A uh, that attract uh, cells like neutrophils and macrophages to the site of infection. They are also known as anaphyla toxins. By the way, things in red are things that I want you to memorize. Um, and uh, also one more thing I wanted to make sure you understand is in the immune system, there are more than one name for the same molecule, like we saw for the membrane uh, cofactor protein or decay accelerating factor. There might be a CD marker and there might be another name. Um, and unfortunately, you have to memorize both. Um, all right, so that was the complement system. Now we talk about the professional phagocytes. Uh, phagocytes uh, are two types, macrophages and neutrophils. Macrophages are present in the tissue and they're present all the time and looking out and hanging out and collecting garbage, which means they are always looking for what's going on around them. They are the sentinel cells versus the neutrophils are in circulation and they are like foot soldiers. They are ready to die. They are When they are called upon, they'll go in to the site of infection and they will kill the microbe and get killed themselves. Those are our foot soldiers. Macrophages, we talked about them, some more details here, produced as monocytes, they enter the tissue, uh, present there as macrophages. They have three states. They might be resting, activated, or hyperactivated. So in resting stage, they are the garbage collectors. They look around and just take small sips. They are no, in no mood to kill. But if they are activated by something like a signal like interferon gamma, then they are going to upregulate their antigen presenting um, molecules such as the class 2 MHC. Those are the billboards they use to present antigen. So they'll start upregulating those molecules. They'll start taking bigger sips than usual and engulf those invaders so they can perform that phagocytosis. But in their hyperactivated macrophages, when they are like really angry because there is an invader that activated them, they're going to take huge sips, right? They're going to stop. They're going to stop proliferating, but they're going to grow larger. They're going to secrete cytokines such as TNF that will give rise to inflammation um, and uh, perform phagocytosis. And they'll also have um, more molecules that will help in killing like reactive oxygen species, lysosomes, things like that. Neutrophils, on the other hand, again, produced in bone marrow, about 70% uh, of the white cells, but they are short-lived. They have a half-life of five days. Uh, they are not antigen-presenting present, cells. So they are not going to present those antigens that they come across to T cells. They are just professional killers. They are just going to, they are on call. When they are called upon, they'll go to from the blood circulation to the site of infection. They kill the microbes and then in the process get killed themselves. Uh, they also phagocytose, so engulf the kill, uh, invaders and kill. They'll use the lysosomal chemicals to liquefy some of the cells and also use some of the cytokines that they can release. Also, if they cannot engulf the whole microbes, they can extra extrude their cellular uh, and um, nuclear contents onto the microbe outside of the cell to form what is known as nets or neutrophil extracellular traps. 
how do the neutrophils know where to go? They have signals that they use to um, use to um, show how to move around and where to go. These are called adhesion molecules and they help in roll, making sure that these cells can roll on the surface of the endothelium and then they can get out of the circulation. So at rest, neutrophils are in this fast lane of just, let, think of the endo, uh, sorry, the blood circulation as freeways. And these neutrophils are our first responders and they are on call 24-7. Just like you guys take calls, these people, these neutrophils are going to take calls and they are going to be looking for any kind of paging system that calls them. So neutrophils are in the fast circulation. Likely they are done with their call. They are going home on the freeway. When they are called upon, uh, say there is a cytokine that's released, gets to the circulation and tells the neutrophils we need help. These neutrophils will use the adhesion molecules on their surface to break so slow down in the circulation so from the fast lane of the freeway they'll move to closer to the uh, peripheral lane of the freeway uh, that to do that they start rolling on the surface using selectins and selectin ligands once they have done that there can be another set of molecules called integrins that are expressed and these integrins the red arrow here uh, that can bind to integrin ligands called icams on the surface of the endothelium that, that brings these neutrophils to a complete stop. So the yellow ones are selectins binding to selectin ligands and integrins binding to integrin ligands. The yellow ones help in rolling and uh, rolling stop and then red ones help them to come to a complete stop. Once they come to a complete stop, they are looking for signals of infection and inflammation that help them to, uh, to bring them out of the circulation um, circulation and follow the scent of some chemicals such as FMET or C5A. Um, they end up at the site of infection where they phagocytose the microbes and help in killing. All right, moving on from phagocytes, we talk about uh, another type of cells called uh, dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are, are another type of antigen presenting cells. These are our messenger molecules that recognize the danger signals. How do they do that? They use something called pattern recognition receptors on their surface. Uh, they recognize the danger signals and these danger signals are called PAMPs and DAMPs. PAMPs are pathogen associated molecular patterns. DAMPs are damage associated molecular patterns from dying cells. Pathogen associated molecular patterns are from pathogens. Uh, they help in activation of macrophages or dendritic cells, right? So they, the PRRs or pattern recognition receptors are on various cells including macrophages, dendritic cells, and they help once the, they recognize the danger signals like PAMPs and DAMPs, they are going to be activated. And then they release cytokines that go to the circulation and uh, send a signal saying we need help. In the meantime, the macrophages start uh, fighting that infection, whereas the dendritic cells go into the, into the lymphatic circulation and uh, go to the lymph nodes where they can present antigens to the T cells. Overall, these pattern rec recognition receptors that are present on these APCs are recognizing PAMPs and DAMPs, and these PAMPs and DAMPs are typically general characteristics that are common to a class of invaders. So they are not as specific as the T cell receptors that have specific to one type of antigen on flu virus. They might be common, they might be recognizing a common structure that is common to several viruses. Um, so usually the structure that they are recognizing are, is going to be indispensable to the pathogen so that it's not typically altered by mutation. So these pattern recognition receptors over time do not have to change, it doesn't have to adapt, it's just present. So there are various types of pattern recognition receptors. Some of the common or well-known PRRs are toll-like receptors. Um, we know several of these um, and each of them can are specific to particular PAMPs or DAMPs, such as there are some that are present to toll-like receptors that are present on the surface of the cells whereas others that are intracellular. 
and the surface ones such as TLR4 may be specific for PEMPs such as lipopolysaccharide on gram-negative bacteria. Remember, it's a class of pe class of microbes that it can uh, recognize. So something like LPS or intracellular structures like single-stranded RNA or double-stranded DNA that can be recognized by particular tool-like receptors such as TLR7 for single-stranded RNA, it's, uh, TLR9 for double-stranded DNA. So uh, the innate immune response is uh, uh, against viruses is provided by a system called interferon system. So interferons are cytokines. They are released um, by different cells, one of the important one being plasma cytoid dendritic cells that are known as the interferon factories. They use TLR7 and 9 to detect a viral RNA or DNA, and then they get activated. When they are activated, they produce 1,000 times more interferon than other cells. The types of interferons that are needed for such viral RNA DNA are inter type 1 interferons, so interferon alpha and beta that are released by these uh, B cells. And what do they do? As the name suggests, they interfere. They interfere with the viral replication, uh, and so they get the name called interferons. How does that work? Here is a virus. When it infects a plasma cytoid dendritic cell, now it's going to release a lot of interferon alpha and beta, and that's going to go ahead and warn other cells. If the cell that's warned is already infected, it will undergo apoptosis versus if it's a worn cell that does not have the virus in it, it's going to carry on the business as usual, but it has been worn, which means it's going to make sure that it's ready uh, if the virus, uh, it comes across the virus. So that's how the interferon warning system works. There are other cells that help in, uh, in detecting and fighting viral infection. These are called natural killer cells. Apart, these cells will target any cell that's damaged. That cell could be damaged by a virus or cancer. Um, these are lymphocytes. NK cells are lymphocytes produced in the bone marrow, but they do not rearrange their DNA like the TNB cells. So they are part of the innate immune system. They have a short half-life. They are similar to neutrophils. They'll use the roll, stop, and exit strategy uh, with selectins and um, integrins to go where they are needed. They also release cytokines like interferon gamma for their function and IL-2. And once they come across the um, their target, they are going to use their activating receptors and inhibitory receptors to determine if it's going to kill that cell or not. So if its inhibitory receptor is bound, it's a normal cell that comes across class 1 MHC, it will not kill the target cell. But say a, t a, c a target cell is damaged by virus and it does not have MHC class 1 on it, the inhibitory cell, oh, sorry, inhibitory receptor will not be um, engaged and in that case the NK cell will be activated and it will uh, kill that target cell. How does it kill? It uses something called perforin and granzyme B enzyme system. It also uses another system called FAS ligand that's present on the NK cells, and it can bind to FAS, that's a molecule present on the target cell, to kill, the, um, kill that um, target cell. So overall, you need both um, of action of uh, the various cells as well as various cytokines that provide that message of what kind of infection is present um, to determine what kind of response it's going to get. So that this just overall shows the mechanisms of the innate immune system that are in play when you come across an infection. That was the last slide. Questions?